The Lord's been talking to me through the Holy Spirit, has been talking to me about holiness, true holiness, true holiness of the heart. And uh, the scripture talks about true holiness. And if there's true holiness, there must be false holiness. Now, those that speak of truth, that speak of compassion, that even speak of love, um, but you don't hear them use the word holy or holiness. There's a lot of folks that are very self-righteous and they never use the word holiness. You won't hear them use the word holiness in their conversation. So there must be a, a truth that is not holiness. They call themselves, they call themselves holy um, in the sense that they think that they have no need of forgiveness. They think they have no need of um, of the Lord's righteousness. They think their righteousness is enough. So there seems to be today a people that um, appear outwardly that they are righteous or that they are good. Um, that they are kind, that they are compassionate. But there's a reason why the writer was inspired to use the words true holiness. Now, this, there's other verses where it says holiness without the word true in front of it. Um, There's a scripture that says, working out our own salvation with fear and trembling, or perfecting holiness, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let's turn to the scripture in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 24. That ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Why didn't he just say, and put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and holiness? Why is he saying true holiness? Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So what he's saying here is that there are those that are saying they're holy, are portraying that they're holy, but they're lying to one another. Why would the writer be saying, putting away lying, if they were not lying? So, they're not being honest. They're not being honest. They're lying to one another. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another.
Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. And then skipping down to verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger in clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Be ye kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now, truth, to be in truth, is more than just information. Truth is not just information. Truth is a nature. It has to do with a nature. Jesus said that he is the truth. The very essence of Jesus is truth. And the Holy Spirit is known to be the spirit of truth. So this truth is not just information. This truth has to do with a change of heart. Has to do with a cleansing. Has to do with a pureness. Has to do with a purity. Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, Forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So, the end result of all of what's being said is forgiveness. Forgiving one another. Forgiving one another. Interesting how it gets back to forgiveness again, isn't it? It it amazes me how many today that speak of truth but know nothing about forgiveness. They try to do their best. They think their best is enough. See, this is a generation that thinks their best, their best, their best is enough. They think that as long as they're, quote unquote, a good person. You ever hear people say that? Well, I'm a good person. Now, obviously, there's people on the earth that go the other direction and could care less about being a good person. But I'm, I'm speaking on those that think that they're good enough. They think they're good enough. They think their goodness, that their ability to be kind... 
And I mean, they'll, they'll go to great lengths to try to be good people. Jesus said, there is none good but God. When someone came to Jesus and said, good master, he said, there's none good but God. See, Jesus knew what was in the heart of man. And if Jesus would have accepted what this person said to him, then Jesus would have had to condone what this man thought of himself. Isn't it true that men praise men because they want to be praised? Right? They love the praise of men and they praise one another. Now, the scripture says, how can you receive the praise that is only of God if you're still receiving the praise of men? If you're seeking the praise of men, there's something wrong if you're seeking the praise of men Why are you seeking the praise of men? Why are you looking for man's approval? That's what this world is all about. This world is seeking for the the praise of men. They're seeking for the appraisal of men. You know, you think about the icons in, in this world, right? Those are the iconic figures. They know that their value is based upon their fans. And they know that their fans is what values them. Not only in money, but also as far as who they are. Without their fans, they're nothing. In other words, without the praise of men, they have no value. Are you listening? But you and I shouldn't be like that. Our value should not be based on what people think of us. Our value should not be based on what we think of ourselves. Amen? Our value should be placed upon the price that Jesus Christ paid for us. That's where our value comes from. If we diminish or belittle the cost that he paid, the price that he paid, then we diminish and take away the value that he placed upon you and I, that he died for. So in other words, you can only know your worth to the measure that you know and understand the price that he paid. Does that make sense? We must have an intimate understanding and a knowing. We must really come to that place to know what Jesus Christ has done for us. And when you understand he has forgiven you, then you can be tenderhearted and forgive others. When you experience his tenderness, when you experience his kindness, then you can in turn share that tenderness and that kindness with others. If God has been good to you through Jesus Christ, then you and I can in turn be good to others, right? In other words, you can only... be kind-hearted and forgiving to one another 
if Jesus has been kind-hearted in forgiving toward you. And that's exactly what it's saying here in verse 32. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So, the way that you and I treat one another is based upon the way we have been treated by the Lord. You've got to accept the Lord's goodness. You've got to accept, and listen, folks, you've got to accept it. You've got to let the Lord be good to you. You've got to let him be kind-hearted towards you. You've got to let the Lord love you. Because until the Lord has been kind to you, been good to you, in forgiving you, you can't be kind hearted and forgiving one another. You can try to do it in your own strength, in your own ability, but it's futile and you will fail. Because there's only one way to truly forgive one another and that is when he has truly forgiven you. Amen? Now, when the Lord has been good to you, you've let him be good to you. You let the Lord, let his tenderness and his kindness work in your heart. And then you can in turn forgive others. There's a real sweetness that flows. God sweetens the heart. And that sweetness in the heart replaces the bitterness. Amen? All that bitterness is gone. And it's replaced with sweetness. Now today, we're living in an hour where sweetness, or should, should I say bitterness, is being called sweet. They put bitter for, or for sweet. They call good evil and evil good. But they put bitter for sweet. So what is considered bitter today, they're calling sweet. See, the devil's trying to confuse people. No, if it's sweet, it'll be demonstrated in tenderheartedness, in kindness. Amen? And not only that, but you won't be partial. You won't be showing kindness and gentleness, tenderness towards one person and then turn around and show bitterness, unforgiveness towards another person. Notice it says in verse 31, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking. Evil speaking. So, in other words, if there's bitterness in our heart, we're going to be speaking evil of somebody. We should never speak evil of anybody. Amen? Now, does that mean you don't tell the truth about people? No, that's not what he's saying. What does it mean to speak evil of somebody? When you speak evil of somebody... 
You're speaking about that person like you are actually better than they are. Like somehow you're above them. Is that kind hearted and forgiving? No. And we need to be kind hearted and forgiving toward everyone. Amen. The Lord really desires to do a work in our hearts, people. True holiness. He's not concerned with just the outward. The Lord wants to do a work in our hearts. He wants to do a real work in our spirits, in our hearts. So that sweet water flows out. So that sweetness flows out. You can't put this on. You see people play acting all the time, trying to act. But this is something God has to do on the inside of us. In our hearts. Amen? And I think God, God through Paul the Apostle, is making a real point here. When he says true holiness. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God, but true holiness. True holiness will be demonstrated by verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. With all malice. And then also verse 32. And be ye kind one to another. Tender hearted. Forgiving one another. Even as God for Christ's sake. Hath forgiven you. 